Hello everyone. This is the second lecture of our course, uh, Tripoli 4851, Advanced Communication Techniques. In this lecture, we will discuss about a problem in wireless communication channel, that is multipath fading. And maybe in future lectures, we will explore some communication techniques that tries to solve this problem. Now, most of the resources of this lecture were taken from this book, specifically chapter 3 and chapter 4 so if you want to understand more on this topic you can go through this book so let us start with this lecture first of all let us understand how wireless propagation environment behaves uh, when a signal is transmitted from our transmitter what happens is basically this signal can be received in a direct path uh, to our receiver which is called the LOS or line of sight path but in addition to that this signal can also be received uh, via reflected or scattered paths uh, this is happening because of the design of our antenna right so when a signal is transmitted obviously it spreads out in different direction and as a result some signals or some portions of the signals get reflected by this tree here or by these uh, buildings here. So at the receiver, basically what happens is we have multiple copies of our transmitted signal at the receiver. And because of this phenomena like this reflection and scattering, obviously at the receiver side, all the components we received or all the signals we received they are not in same situation some of them will have some amount of attenuation or delay or phase shift so what is attenuation attenuation means degradation of power level at the receiver so some of the components or some of the signal received at the receiver will have different level of amplitude or different level of power that is basically the phenomena of attenuation and obviously we also know that there should be some kind of delay associated with all of these different components or different versions of the signal because each of them are traveling different paths so different amount of time will be needed for each of them so that's why there should be delay and also there will be phase shift because we are sending uh, carrier signals that is sinusoidal obviously all periodical signal will have some kind of phase shift as long as there is some delay associated with our signal right so three things we will experience one of them is attenuation then delay and also phase shift and because at the receiver all of these different version of the signals are received at the same time so all of them will interfere at the receiver and that phenomena we are calling this as multipath interference now because of this multipath interference our net receive signal can experience either amplification or attenuation based on the situation of our wireless channel now this variation of the received signal strength because of our multipath components or multipath received signals at the receiver side this situation is basically termed as multipath fading or sometimes just simply as fading now let us try to build an analytical model for our wireless channel considering the effect of this multipath fading um, first of all let us define the transmitted signal that is the signal to be transmitted through our wireless channel that is called the pass vent wireless signal s of t now this s of t can be defined like this if you can recall uh, we had already seen this expression uh, this is just basically the complex representation of transmitted signal here this s b of t can be written as x of t plus j y of t so s b of t is basically just the complex representation of baseband signal without the carrier and this e to the power j 2 pi f c t is the complex representation of carrier signal 
or in real form this carrier signal is actually uh, cos 2 pi fct as we had seen before and we just for the simplification of calculation we convert this whole expression into complex form as uh, this right Now after uh, defining our transmitter signal S of T, we can start with designing the analytical model of our wireless channel. Uh, so first of all, we will assume that our wireless channel is linear time invariant. If you remember, for a system to be linear time invariant, there should be some rules or requirements to be fulfilled. To understand those, let us understand what is linearity and also time invariance so to fulfill linearity property we had two requirements one of them was superposition Second one was homogeneity. Right. So first of all, let us look at this superposition, right? So in superposition, basically, what it says is, if I have two input signals, x1 of t and another one is x2 of t and we have a system like this okay and finally we have the output y of t now if you add these two signals first like this then send to your system to get the output y of t that is one case Another case can be like you have x1 of t and x2 of t. You take your system, but for each of the input signals, you use the same system twice. like this and then after getting the output from both of these systems you add them up like this and finally get the output y prime of t so for a system to fulfill this superposition rule this y of t and y prime of t has to be equal that means whether you add the inputs before going through the system here like this or after going through the system then add them up these two phenomenon basically returns the same output so y t is equal to y prime of t that is superposition now let us look at homogeneity for homogeneity basically let's say we have an input x of t and then 
we multiply this with a constant k okay then it goes to our system and finally we get the output y of t now there can be another approach here that x of t first goes through our system we get some output that output is multiplied with this constant k and finally we get the output y prime of t now here also for our system to fulfill homogeneity property this y of t should be equal to y prime of t that means whether you multiply with a constant before going through the system like he here or after going through the system then multiplying with k both of this approach results in similar value that is y of t should be equal to y prime of t so if our system fulfills these two conditions then we can say our system is linear or it fulfills the linearity property now to understand time invariance again let us define an input x of t and that goes through our system and finally we get the output y of t right now if you shift our input signal with a time t naught okay so time shifted input signal and that goes through our system like this then at the output our output signal should experience the same amount of time shift that means we will get an output of t y, y of t minus t naught so that is time invariance so if you so for time invariance to be fulfilled a time delay or time advance of the input signal should lead to an identical time shift in the output signal that is the property of time invariance now if our system fulfills both linearity and also time invariance then we can say our system is linear time invariant system or in short LTI system now if we understand what linear time invariant systems are then here we are assuming that our wireless channel should be a linear time invariant system or LTI system and also we are considering that our channel has L multipath component previously we had understood that our wireless channel should have multipath components and we are assuming here our system has L multipath components now if you look at this figure this is just a simple a simple representation of our wireless communication system and here S of T is the transmitted signal transmitted from our transmitter using this antenna and this is the representation of our wireless channel with L multipaths starting from 0 up to L minus 1 and we want to build an analytical model for this wireless channel to do that we are going to derive the impulse response of the channel which is called h of t here and at the receiver we have received signal y of t which will be received by this antenna 
Now, first of all, we need to formulate h of t, that is the impulse response of the channel. And after getting that, we can just easily formulate from the assumption of LTI system that our output signal y of t is equal to s of t convolved with h of t. Now, each path in this wireless channel has two characteristic properties. One of them is the delay of the signal because each of the signals travels different propagation distance. And the next one is the attenuation of the signal or degradation of power level of the signal because of the scattering effect and also sometimes reflection effect. Now, if we want to just model one path, that is ith path of this multipath wireless propagation channel, we can characterize it by two parameters. One of them is the attenuation factor ai and another one is the path delay tau of i. And if I want to derive the impulse response of an LTI system which attenuates a signal by this factor ai and delays it by tau of i that can be given as h of i of t is equal to a i delta t minus tau i. For example, if I had an LDI system where we didn't have this kind of attenuation and delay then that impulse response of the system would be simply like this h of t equals to delta t right and because we have a path delay tau of i that's why we have delta t minus tau of i and because of this attenuation we have this attenuation factor a of i which should be written here and this is the impulse response for one path ith path right of our wireless channel. So this equation gives the impulse response of a single path of our wireless channel. And in this way we can model each of the paths of our multipath propagation channel starting from 0 up to L minus 1th path, right? So for 0th path the attenuation is A0 delay is tau 0 and our impulse response can be given as h0 of t is equal to a0 delta t minus tau 0. In the similar way, we can derive h1, h2 up to hl minus 1. And these are just single path impulse responses. We have l such paths. And if I want to get the total response of the wireless channel, that is the multipath response of wireless channel which we can call as h of t. That should be the sum of individual responses from each path as we had calculated here. And if I just add them up together starting from h0 of t up to h l minus 1 of t, then we can just write like this each of this expression and add them up, right? That is the multipath response of our wireless channel h of t. So, if I just combine all of them, this multipath impulse response of wireless channel can be written as summation starting from i is equal to 0 up to l minus 1 and inside we have a i delta t minus tau i. This is the total response or impulse response of our wireless channel. Now, as our channel is linear time invariant, uh, the total received signal can be calculated as uh, y of t which is the convolution of these two parameters a s of t the transmitted signal and the impulse response of our channel h of t we had already said that that this is possible because our system is linear time invariant now we can expand h of t uh, like this starting from h of h0 of t up to h l minus 1 of t so impulse response of each path is written here and then we can further simplify it like this so instead of one convolution we have to do l convolutions right for each of the path we have 
one impulse response and if I just do the convolution with s of t I will get the response for each path output of each path like for path 0 we have y of 0 for path 1 we have y of 1 so in this way for each of the path we will have one uh, response and finally after adding all those up we are going to get the total response of the channel right which is what we want to find out now from this similar understanding we can also say that received signal for ith path can be written as y i of t is equal to convolution between these two parameters s of t and h i of t here h i of t is the impulse response for ith path right so we have to find that out because if we can find that out then we can find out uh, the individual responses for each of the paths starting from 0 up to L minus 1 if I just add them up then I am going to get the total response right so we have to find y i of t using this formula to do that first let us understand some properties of impulse function right so the first rule we are going to uh, see here is this one x of t convolved with delta t is equal to x of t itself if you remember convolution basically in convolution what we are doing if this is x of t like this and this is our delta t function or impulse function right so we will have just one spike here with an amplitude one that is delta t now to convolve delta t with our x of t we just place delta t over our x of t graph right so starting from minus infinity up to plus infinity we just move our delta t graph over our x of t graph so like this at the start maybe here delta t will be here and then shift here then here like this so we move from minus infinity to plus infinity and for each of the case for each of the case we multiply delta t with x of t so for the first case obviously it will not give any kind of value if I want to see the output right here let's say if I want to see the output so for the second case mul delta t multiplied with x of t we will give some kind of value here like this for this one maybe here like this because the amplitude of delta t is equal to 1 so if I multiply that obviously whatever the value x of t has at this position will be coming here and also here so in this way for each of the movement we will get values like this right so in this way we are going to get the same type of curve basically if, if we see right so even though I am not I couldn't draw it properly but I guess you still get the idea that if I do the convolution of delta t with x of t I will get the same function x of t now let's look at the second property that is if I convolve x of t with delta t minus t naught that is delta function but shifted to t naught time right so if this is 0 then maybe this is t naught and here we have the impulse fun function like this so that is delta t minus t naught and if I just do the convolution of x of t with delta t minus t naught it will basically give us x t minus t naught that means if this is our x of t graph again like this maybe then this 
whole x of t will be shifted to t naught like this so maybe if this is 0 and this is t naught so something like this okay so it just got shifted to t naught because of our convolution between x of t and delta t minus t naught so that that is our second uh, property and the third property is basically if you have a constant multiplied with our delta t in this convolution that will not affect at all that means we can just move k in front and do the convolution of x of t and delta t so we will get a similar response like this so the result is x of t but we have a constant at the front that is k so if we understand these three properties then we can move on with deriving the received signal for ith path okay now we know that y i of t is equal to s of t convolved with h i of t so this is the received signal for ith path right and uh, we can replace the value of h i of t which is a i delta t minus tau i we had seen that before we are just replacing the value here in place of h i of t now we can simplify it further like this so we can just put a i in front and then have our expression of s of t convolved with delta t minus tau i right so this portion here just follows this property so we can just simply write s of t minus tau i and we already have this a i in front so this expression comes out as y i of t or the received signal from ith path now we just found out the received signal for ith path that is y i of t is equal to a i s t minus tau i that is the received signal for one path ith path using this formula we can find out the received signal for each path starting from 0 up to l minus 1 path right so if I just combine all of these signals, receive signal from each path that and add them up, that will give us the total receive signal y of t. So that is what we are doing here. Uh, the total receive signal y of t is equal to the sum of individual receive signal from each path starting from y of 0 up to y l minus 1. So we can just write our expression like this here, combination of all the components or all the received signal from each path and then just replace the value of y i here like this so that will give us the total received signal y of t for our wireless channel so y of t or the total received signal can be written as summation of all the components that is starting from i is equal to 0 up to l minus 1's path for that a i is t minus tau i that is the total receive signal of our wireless channel now from equation 2.1 the formula for transmitted passband signal the signal we are going to transmit through our wireless channel that was defined as this one right at the very beginning of our derivation if you remember now we have to put this value of s of t inside of this equation that is the total received signal y of t so here we have to put the value of s of t so let us write the value here so we know y of t is equal to summation starting from i up to l minus 1 a of i is t minus tau i right so if i just put the value here then what will happen summation will be here 
we will be here and here we have real part of is b so is b has t so it will be shifted by tau i and exponential term has also another t so it will be shifted also so like this t minus tau i so there that is the total expression now you can just uh, take this real portion in front because uh, these things are already real so no problem there so you can just put it here real then this whole expression can be written so that is written here so y of t is equal to real of uh, summation of uh, i up to l minus 1 and we have the amplitude or the attenuation factor ai then complex baseband signal here and then the exponential portion right so if you look at this one you will see that this portion right here the exponential portion can be written like this e to the power j 2 pi fc t multiplied by e to the power j 2 pi fc tau i and there should be minus here so in this way we can write and if you look at the total expression here this e to the power j 2 pi f c t this is actually common to all the components starting from i up to l minus 1 for all of them we are going to get 1 e to the power j 2 pi f c t term so we can just take this portion common for all of them and that is done here so here we have this term taken as common and the other portions are written here. Now this e to the power j 2 pi fct this portion is nothing but the carrier signal or unaltered carrier signal that we transmitted from our transmitter. So this portion right here this is actually called the equivalent received baseband signal. It is not exactly the baseband signal which we wanted at the receiver side but we are getting some kind of baseband signal that is the equivalent version of our received baseband signal so think of it like this in our total expression obviously our carrier signal is altered or corrupted also our baseband signal is b that is also altered right like this so we can just uh, show the expression at the receiver side like this so altered baseband signal and altered carrier signal or another approach is we will take our carrier signal as unaltered and take this portion as equivalent received baseband signal which is altered or there are some uh, phase shift attenuation everything is there but our carrier signal is unaltered so that is how we model our wireless channel considering the effect of multipath fading now uh, from this whole equation the equivalent received baseband signal is this portion right so previously we had seen that this is our whole equation the total received signal and from that this portion is the equivalent received baseband signal and that is written here like this so here you can see that in addition to attenuation and delay parameters like here this is the delay parameter t minus tau i and attenuation is a i in addition to these two parameters we have also another parameter here which is e to the power minus j 2 pi f c tau i this parameter basically arises because of the path delay of carrier signal obviously this multipath effect this affects our baseband signal as well as our carrier signal and in fact our carrier signal is affected more because the frequency is higher and phase shift can happen for the slightest amount of delay in the propagation channel so here each ith signal copy arising from the ith multipath component is associated with following three parameters right one of them is the attenuation factor ai 
the path delay tau i and also a new one which is the phase factor e to the power minus j 2 pi fc tau i now we will see one example from our textbook example number 3.1 here it's written that uh, consider a wireless channel with a carrier frequency of fc is equal to 850 megahertz which is transmitted over a wireless channel that results in l is equal to 4 multipath components at delays of 201 513 819 and 1223 nanosecond so we have four components four multipath components with different delays starting from 201 up to 1223 nanosecond right and each of them has obviously some different signal amplitude that is written as uh, corresponding to received signal amplitudes of 1, 0 0.6, 0 0.3 and 0 0.2 respectively. Now we have to derive the expression for the received basement signal that is YB of T. If the transmitted basement signal is SB of T. So let us try to solve this one. First of all, we have to write the equation for received baseband signal or equivalent received baseband signal yb of t. We had seen previously that this can be written like this and we have to find out the value here for all four components, all four multipath components. So if I want to do that, uh, we have to find out the factor ai e to the power j 2 pi fc tau i, this portion, right? So this portion should be calculated first, then we can finally get the value of this one. This is just the delay. So tau i is the value of uh, delays here written like this. So first of all, let's find out this factor, right? So if I talk about the zeroth path that means for i is equal to 0 then this factor is this one a0 e to the power j 2 pi fc tau naught a0 that is the first multipath component that has signal amplitude of 1 so a0 is 1 e to the power j 2 pi then we will also have to write the value of frequency right we have seen that frequency is 850 megahertz written here 850 multiplied by 10 to the power 6 and then finally we have again the value of delay so for the first component the delay was 201 nanosecond so that is written here 201 10 to the power minus 9 so that value can be written like this finally comes out as this value so in the similar way we can find out the parameters for i is equal to 1, i is equal to 2, and i is equal to 3, right? And afterwards, we can just simply write the total expression of received baseband signal. So for the first component, you see, this portion was calculated earlier, and then we have finally the delay portion, SBT minus the amount of delay. If I look at the second one, we had already found out this portion here like this and for the delay, we know the delay is 513 nanosecond that is written here. So in this way, all the components are added up to get the total expression of received baseband signal. And uh, from this example, we can see that uh, here we have L is equal to 4 signal copies and each of them delayed by some amount of tau i time and uh, obviously attenuated by some amount of ai right now let us understand what is delay spread uh, here we are seeing a example of multipath signal components received at the receiver so this is the first component this is the second component third and fourth right so we have four components and here this ts this is the symbol duration or symbol time uh, the duration of one symbol now here you see each of them has different amount of attenuation and also delay we are not talking about the attenuation here just 
uh, observe the delays so you see the first component arrived first then some delay for the second component uh, even more for the third one and the last one arrives at the last so here we define delay spread as the delay between the first and the last arriving copies of the signal that means uh, first arriving copy arrived here and the last one arrived here so if i talk about this symbol this symbol arrived first here and at last arrived for this one so this duration td is called the delay spread for our uh, situation here now let us see what could be a typical value of delay spread in outdoor cellular channels so here in this figure you can see we have the transmitter which transmitted some signal uh, and we have two paths multi paths uh, for one path it was deflected from a tree and the distance it covered was d1 is equal to 3 kilometer and another one is the direct path or line of sight path uh, that distance is 2 kilometers so we have to find out the delay spread for this case so we have two components and what is the delay between uh, these two components in arriving to our receiver side right to find that out we can use very simple uh, formulas like this so uh, we know that uh, s is equal to vt right this formula so we have to find out the value of t time so we can just write t is equal to s by v here is the distance is basically this distance these two distances here and obviously this speed will be speed of light because our uh, signals travel at a speed of light so if we just use this kind of formulas then we can find out the value of propagation delays that is tau zero and tau one and using these two value then finally we can get the value of delay spread delta t which is the difference between tau one and tau naught so this can be calculated like this uh, so delta t is the difference between uh, these two distances 3 kilometers and 2 kilometers and this is the speed of light and finally our delay spread value comes as 3.3 microsecond which is for 1 kilometer propagation distance am I right so we can get some idea about uh, what should be the value of delay spread based on a typical uh, propagation distance but this calculation does not give us the exact calculation of delay spread it just gives us some idea however um, for a typical outdoor cellular channel where the distances are of the order of kilometers like typically one to five kilometers then this delay spread can be of the order of one to three microsecond now we will discuss about a very important parameter in defining the condition of wireless channel that is intersymbol interference or isi so here if you look at this figure uh, consider we have a signal x of t which we are transmitting from our transmitter and when it travels through our wireless channel and finally received at our receiver uh, you see we have received two components one of them is this one with path delay of zero that is the direct component or LOS line of sight component and another one received uh, with a delay of tau one okay so these two components are received and here one thing to notice is that the symbol duration TS is this one right now the net signal received by the receiver is the addition of these two signals and some things to observe here is that obviously the delay spread td can be calculated as difference between these two that is tau 1 minus tau 0 that is delay spread and from this picture we can understand that uh, our delay spread td is comparable to ts they are almost equal so what will happen because of this situation we can see we have two signals here and they will be added up at the receiver and because of this if you look at the picture 
S1 symbol from this signal will get mixed up with this S0 symbol of the next signal. Same can be said here also. S2 will be mixed up with S1 here. So in this way, different symbol or subsequent symbols will get mixed up and will corrupt the signal. This form of distortion of signal where one symbol gets interfered with the subsequent symbol, this phenomena is called intersymbol interference. Now let us understand what can be the situation of intersymbol interference for different amount of delay spread. Like for example here we can see at the receiver we have received two signal components one of them from the direct path without any delay and another one from a non line of sight path which has some amount of delay and the delay spread td can be calculated as the difference of arrival time from this signal and this signal that is td right and here uh, the value of td is much less compared to the value of ts or symbol duration so that's why still uh, the intersymbol interference is very negligible here because td is much less than ts now let us look at the second example here we have again two signal components one from direct path another one with uh, non line of sight path and here the delay spread is much higher compared to the previous one so it is almost comparable to our symbol duration ts as a result you can see subsequent symbols are getting mixed up so here s1 is getting interfered with s0 here so in this way when our delay spread is comparable to symbol duration ts at that moment inter symbol interference starts to happen and for the third case here we can see we have four multipath signal components received at the receiver first one is the direct path component and we have another three received so in this case obviously the delay spread is much higher compared to the previous examples it is even higher than our symbol duration and as a result two things happen we have uh, higher delay between the first and last arriving components and obviously the number of interfering paths also increase as a rule of thumb you can say so as td is higher obviously there will be more components received uh, at the receiver as a result the severity of inter symbol interference increases Up to now, everything we have discussed, uh, these are only just the impacts of multipath fading in time domain. Like we have discussed delay spread and intersymbol interference. These are just uh, time domain phenomena uh, happening because of multipath fading. Now, if we want to understand the impact of fading in frequency domain also, then we will have to introduce a new parameter which is called coherence bandwidth or BC. Now first of all let us uh, derive the frequency response of wireless channel. Previously we modeled our wireless channel using the impulse response age of t. Now if I want to get the frequency response of the same wireless channel which is h of f that can be done using Fourier transform on h of t right so h of f is equal to the Fourier transform of h of t so here h of f is the frequency response of our wireless channel and often time this is also termed as the channel filter because it acts like a filter to our transmitted signal later on we will understand why this frequency response is sometimes called channel filter Now to understand uh, the effect of multipath fading in frequency domain, we will use delay spread TD. So here in the first picture here, figure A, you can see that this is just simply the impulse response of our channel. And here 
we are taking a simple case where we have only one component one signal component or one multipath component arriving at the receiver that is the direct line of sight component so obviously the delay spread will be zero and in this scenario we are just saying that the wireless channel comprises of a single propagation path now for that case we can write the impulse response of the channel h of t as delta t because uh, we know for a propagation path i the impulse res response can be written as a i delta t minus tau i so as there is only one path and that has no delay spread obviously tau i will be zero right this is cancelled and also we are assuming that ai is also one so that is why h of t for this case can be written as delta t we have only one path and uh, without any delay so for this case if i want to get the frequency domain representation we have to do the Fourier transform and after doing that that means we are going to uh, get the Fourier transform of delta t right so the Fourier transform of delta t is equal to 1 so in frequency domain we will have a picture like this so as we have uh, h of f is equal to 1 that means in frequency domain we have value of 1 here from minus infinity to infinity so we have constant value of 1 that is the frequency response for the first case if we have h of t like this with only one component one signal component and td is equal to 0 right that is what is written here so we have a frequency response of constant one and this is a flat frequency response over the entire frequency band right now let us look at the second case b where our delay spread td is increasing right so uh, we know that if this is h of t or the impulse response of our channel then it can be shown as the combination of each of the signal components right so if one component is here like this then another one is this so each of them has some amount of delay and also uh, there is some amplitude right so just like we described before each of the path component will have an amount of delay and also some amplitude so if i just combine all those up we will have a graph like this or a picture like this where uh, we have different components and we are getting this h of t or impulse response of the channel now we want to see the frequency response of this situation so what happens obviously as our uh, td has increased or delay spread has increased that means in time domain our graph has expanded compared to before so obviously just like before we will not get infinite bandwidth right so our bandwidth here has got reduced compared to previous one so as the delay spread increases it causes decrease in the bandwidth of the frequency response h of f so here h of f has decreased so let us go further by showing what happens when td or delay spread is equal to infinite at that moment obviously our our frequency band will shrink even more that's why we will see just one impulse function as our h of f right so this is h of f and this is just an impulse function or delta function in the frequency domain so we can see that as our delay spread is increasing 
our frequency response is decreasing or the band of frequency response is decreasing. In this way, we have an inverse relationship between delay spread TD and the frequency response of the channel. Now, what is coherence bandwidth? Coherence bandwidth BC is defined as the bandwidth of the frequency response, right? So here, this flat portion of our frequency response can be called the coherence bandwidth. Now, let us try to model uh, our channel in frequency domain. Previously, we had modeled our wireless channel as an LTI system such that Y of T is equal to convolution of S of T and H of T, where S of T is the transmitted signal, H of T is the impulse response of our wireless channel, and Y of T is the received signal. What could be the frequency domain representation of this channel model? That can be written like this. Y of F is equal to S of F multiplied by H of F. Because we know from our previous understanding that convolution in time domain is just multiplication in frequency domain. So all these values or parameters are just the frequency domain representation of this parameter like uh, Y of T in frequency domain can be written as Y of F. So in this way, we are going to get the frequency domain representation of our channel model. So it is graphically shown here. So we have transmitted signal S of F, then it goes through our wireless channel response H of F. And finally, we get the spectrum of received signal as Y of F. Now, what is the significance of this quantity BC? Um, to understand that, um, let us observe this uh, scenario where we want to see the impact of coherence bandwidth on a transmitted signal S of T. So that transmitted signal is this one in frequency domain, uh, which is S of F. And the next one is the wireless channel frequency response, H of F. And the third one is just the multiplication of these two which is the output y of f right so this is the spectrum of output and bs here is the bandwidth of our signal and bc is the coherence bandwidth or the bandwidth of the frequency response of our channel now uh, in this figure as you can see uh, as bs or the signal bandwidth is less than coherence bandwidth uh, Obviously, this uh, BS only spans the flat part of our frequency response, right? So, when we multiply these two signals, obviously, we will get the undistorted input at the output, right? Because uh, this curve basically spans only the flat portion. That's why we are just getting uh, a scaled version of S of F or the input signal corresponding to the magnitude of the flat part. That means uh, depending on this magnitude here, we are getting a scaled version here, but all the portions here are actually unaltered or undistorted, right? So that is what is uh, actually important to understand here the whole input signal s of f is undistorted just because bc is greater than our bs or signal bandwidth and this type of wireless channel is uh, simply termed as the flat fading channel because it gives a flat response uh, over its entire region right for this signal we had seen that it gives a flat response for the whole signal itself and now uh, let us consider another case where bs is actually greater than our coherence bandwidth bc so that is actually shown here so bs has a higher bandwidth compared to our coherence bandwidth bc this is the input signal in frequency domain this is the frequency response and this is the output and if you look here obviously as this is shorter than our signal bandwidth obviously uh, different portion of our input signal will 
experience different level of attenuation because we know these two will be multiplied to get our output and obviously as the value is not same always the most amount of gain will be here and for these portions our input signals will be attenuated so different frequency will get different level of attenuation and that's why we are going to get a distorted output at the receiver side we are going to get a distorted version of our input signal and this kind of channel and th this kind of channel is basically termed as the frequency selective channel because it is frequency selective some of the portions will get uh, higher gain some of the portions will get uh, attenuated just because of their frequency that's why this channel is frequency selective channel so in this way uh, the impact of coherence bandwidth on our transmitted signal s of t can be summarized as when our signal bandwidth is less than coherence bandwidth at that moment there will be no distortion in the received signal and we call that flat fading and when our signal bandwidth is higher than coherence bandwidth there will be distortion at the received signal and we call that frequency selective fading now using this method we can uh, use coherence bandwidth to determine the maximum allowed bandwidth for our transmitted signal s of t uh, like uh, if our signal bandwidth exceed coherence bandwidth obviously that will get distorted so in this way we can find out the maximum allowed bandwidth for our signal and mathematically the relationship between our coherence bandwidth and delay spread can be shown roughly as coherence bandwidth is equal to inverse of delay spread so using this formula given the value of delay spread we can find out the value of coherence bandwidth for example uh, previously we said that typically for a outdoor cellular channel the delay spread value is around 2 microsecond then we can calculate the value of coherence bandwidth using this formula and that comes out as 250 kilohertz so the typical coherence bandwidth of outdoor cellular wireless channel is 250 kilohertz for this wireless channel if our bandwidth that means the bandwidth of transmitted signal exit 250 kilohertz obviously then this signal will get distorted that's all for this lecture thank you